Hi, my name is Jamal Watson and welcome to In the Margins. In the third Reconstruction, America's struggle for racial justice in the 21st century, Dr. P. Neil Joseph, one of the nation's most prominent historians of race and democracy, argues that this century's struggle for full citizenship and dignity for Black Americans is just as momentous as the movements that arose after the Civil War and during the Civil Rights era. Dr. Joseph is the Barbara Jordan Chair in Ethics and Political Values, founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, and associate dean for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author of award-winning books on African-American history, including my favorite, Sword in the Shield and Stokely A Life. Great to be in conversation today with my friend. Welcome, Dr. Joseph. Hey, Brother Jamal, thank you. Thank you for, for having me on. So I want to start off with, how, how do you define the third reconstruction? Because obviously we learned um, growing up about first reconstruction. Uh, many of us learn, historians learned about the second reconstruction. How do you define the third reconstruction? Well, I, I, I define it as a period that starts in 2008 and has continued to the present. So I don't actually foreclose it. And the four pivot points for me, um, Jamal, are the election of Barack Obama, the insurgency of BLM 1.0, the first one, 2013, before Michael Brown, after Trayvon Martin, the rise of MAGA and Trump 2016 are the, the third point. And then finally, the fourth point is really 2020 and everything that's come after, because in 2020, you see all these racial, these juxtapositions, right, of racial progress and white backlash, right? So you see the inequality of the pandemic. We see the George Floyd protest and the way in which the George Floyd protest converge with BLM because BLM had always argued that the criminal justice system was a panoramic gateway to multiple systems of oppression. Wealth inequality, health, uh, immigration status, citizenship, race, class, gender, sexuality, all of it, just everything, public school segregation, um, the militarism, materialism, racism that Dr. King talked about, all of it. And you start to see those conversations happening. You see both the most racially divisive presidential campaign in American history, but then you see 81 million people, really mm -hmm. largely because of BLM, come out and oppose white supremacy, 81 right. to 74 million. And then in January, we continue to see those juxtapositions. We see Warnock and Ossoff because of the activism of Stacey Abrams, which we forget on January 5th. And then we see the January 6th white riot at the US Capitol. We see Trump impeached a second time on January 13th. And then on January 20th, we see Amanda Gorman, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden provide this reconstructionist vision of American democracy. So that's what I think is the third reconstruction. It's this continuing battle between the forces of Reconstruction, Reconstructionists who are supporters of multiracial democracy versus Redemptionists who are advocates of white supremacy, the Confederacy, those monuments, the Confederate flag, but also just Black subordination, Black dehumanization. So, but there's also a story, I imagine, of progress and backlash, right, as well. So even at the moment when Barack Obama is becoming, you know, the nation's president, we see the kind of attacks on himself and also on Black people beginning to, to rise. And so what, what I thought was very interesting is that you start the book with the George Floyd incident, which I think is so telling because, you know, when we think about Reconstruction, often we think about progress, but historically it's also been the backlash too, right? Absolutely. It's a progress, as perfectly said. It's a, pro it's a story of progress and backlash. And, you know, one of the things that you say there, Jamal, that, that I want to stress is that the book is really about these narrative wars and so much of history, and you know this in the work that you do, it's about the stories we tell ourselves. When we tell ourselves stories about our family history, about the block, the neighborhood, the church, right? We are co-creating our reality. Those stories lead us to certain actions, behaviors, certain traditions, right? In our country nationally, they lead to certain policies, they lead to coalitions, but also disputes. They lead to alliances, but they lead to political conflicts, right? Generational conflicts. 
Um, they lead to inequalities, but they also can lead to progress and social justice. So, so much of the book is really what I wanted to share with people, including young people, was just the fact that the narratives that we've been taught about American history leave so much out. And so the pivot points are these reconstructionist versus redemptionist narratives. In the first reconstruction, the lost cause white supremacist narrative wins. The Dunning School of History that says reconstruction was a failure because black men were trying to rape white women, that mm. wins. That says yeah. lynching was justified and the Klan were heroes. And we can see that in Birth of a Nation in 1915, the Klansman novel by Thomas Dixon in 1905, Gone yeah. with the Wind in 1939. That becomes part of the culture. They're not only hosted at the White House, but the reason we can't get an anti-lynching bill until 2022 is because of that story. And in mm -hmm. the second reconstruction, there's a reconstructionist story of racial justice as a political and moral good that wins out, but it wins out with a redemptionist drift baked into it. So mm -hmm. Barack Obama becomes sort of the, um, the peak of that story because Obama tells you a story of American exceptionalism where even a black man and a black family can be in the White House, but they color within the lines. People are still saying, if your pants are too baggy, if you did something wrong, you can get shot and killed, right? So Obama's in the White House and Pookie is still in the outhouse, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when we think about where we're at in this third reconstruction, what Obama presides over is the demise of that racial justice consensus that existed mm -hmm. from 1963 to 2013. Mm -hmm. It's unbeknownst to him for much of his term. The people who did know that that was ending was the Black Lives Matter activists, the mm -hmm. Black women and men, feminists, queer folks who are part of that BLM trajectory. They understood, and that's why they were pushing him, they were pushing the nation, they were pushing Black communities to say all Black lives should matter, right? Yeah. That means Bayard Rustin and James Baldwin and Audre Lorde and Barbara Smith and Paul, uh, you know, Paulie Murray, and not just Malcolm and Martin. Yeah, no, that's very important. I think one of the um, one of the ways in which we should be thinking about Black Lives Matter is that it was a very kind of strategic um, and, you know, a way of thinking about some of these issues. I think sometimes we frame it as, oh, this is all ad hoc, people just kind of coming together. No, folks are, to your point, very strategic about how they're going to map out a plan and a strategy and push us towards that, right? Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, when you think about the Black Lives Matter ferment, the, what I talk about in the book, I include Stacey Abrams, you know, the moral Mondays of Reverend William Barbara, who's also talked about the third reconstruction. It becomes a ferment where you think about BLM, March for Our Lives, immigration rights, um, rights for Muslims, LGBTQIA, uh, Latinx folk, Asian American, Pacific Islanders, indigenous, like always, like Dr. King did with the Poor People's Campaign, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Torre did with alliances mm -hmm. with Native Americans and Chicanos and other people, We've always been at the leading edge of this mo notion of multiracial democracy. If Black yeah. people succeed, everyone will succeed. We're not yeah. interested in leaving people behind and marginalizing people. And I wanted to tell that story um, in a way that was uh, that felt really, you know, Dr. King talked about the fierce urgency of now, and I wanted to tell that story with that urgency. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And and and, and as you talk, I mean, one of the things that that struck me is. Again, the way in which you focus very deliberately on Black women uh, in this book as well. And I was wondering, can you talk about that? Because for our um, for our audience, I mean, one of the things that struck me was this wonderful picture here <laughs> on page four of you with your mother. Uh, I guess it was 1976, around that time in Jamaica, yeah. Queens, New York. And um, obviously, you know, her background, her sacrifice, the you know, being a, a Haitian immigrant, um, sort of meant so much to you. And I was wondering, can you talk about her, your experience through her and also about Black women in general, which you focus quite, quite oh, a bit? Oh, no, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, my mother, Jermaine Joseph, you know, I wouldn't be here without her. And she's been my biggest influence and mentor. She's a historian. She's a feminist. She's a labor activist. She was part of uh, SCIU 1199, worked at Mount Sinai Hospital for 40 years. And um you know, so much of what I learned was through watching her example of dignity, watching her example 
of activism and anti-racism and social justice activism, but also feminism. I got interested in feminism and the feminist movement because of her. Mm. So she's been, you know, she's a Christian New Bethel Baptist Church going every week because of her and finding out both about Haitian history because of her, but also Black American history and really understanding myself to be both including African as well, like uh, Kwame Touré, Malcolm X taught us, Marcus Garvey, we're all African people, right? Mm -hmm. African, Haitian, Black American. So we took a lot of pride in all of that. And I think that what that showed me, I was lucky enough to study with Sonia Sanchez at Temple University. And I was at rallies with Ramona Africa and at rallies with all these different Black women and men, of course, men, Black men and women are co-architects, but I wanted to focus on women because I think that the stories of the third reconstruction in a lot of ways were led by black women. When we think about Nicole Hannah Jones and Stacey Abrams and Tamika Mallory and Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi, Patrice Con Colors, all these different black women. And then I wanted to connect them to Ange- Angela Davis and Audre Lord and Barbara Smith and you know Bell Hooks and um, Kathy Cohen and Beth Ritchie and that generation, you know Barbara Ransby, so many others, and and then Ida B. Wells too, mm-hmm. or in Reconstruction. So I wanted to show how these are these three different generations of Black activists, but Black women who are abolition uh, democracy proponents. You know they want to um, really abolish all forms of punishment and dehumanization and have us invest in this idea of multiracial democracy, that's gonna include dignity and citizenship for all people, healthcare, wealth equity, uh, the end of residential and public school segregation, but also we're the biggest uh, people who are marginalized by environmental racism, right? We're the biggest who are marginalized by having our kids have asthma. So we're disproportionately underrepresented in all the positive social economic indicators and overrepresented in all the negative. And I wanted to show how really through three periods of reconstruction, black women have really expansively reimagined democracy, but it's only in the third reconstruction um, that they've been acknowledged as such, you know? And we can see that we're in a nation never have had a black governor, female governor in, in American history out of all 50 states. Stacey Abrams was denied really illegally by Brian Kemp, but that, that struggle continues. So I wanted to really show their impact on me, but also the world. Yeah. And when I think of you and your work there at Texas, of course, think about Barbara Jordan as well. Uh, absolutely. And I talk of, about Barbara Jordan. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to mention uh, Barbara as well, because, of course, in the political spectrum, I mean, she is the master, right? I mean, in many ways. Absolutely. Barbara Jordan, I hold the Barbara Jordan chair here at the LBJ school. And, you know, Barbara Jordan, uh, you know, the first Black woman to be in the Texas state legislature, uh, the first Black woman to, you know, represent um, Congress uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, first Southerner in 70 years after George C. White in North Carolina. So unbelievably important. And we remember her for the Watergate hearing. She's the first Black person to give a keynote at any of the major party conventions in 1976. And so her her huge policy legacy is co-sponsoring the 1975 Voting Rights Act extension, which actually puts Texas under the Voting Rights Act um, really until 2013 in a meaningful way and provided um, education for dual language and multiple language speakers. So when we see those voter aki signs, that's because um, of Barbara Jordan, right? And so she's, she's huge and we need to think about her legacy and example in terms of democracy and voting rights now more than ever. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. The intro in the book uh, caught my attention because you focus quite a bit on your own upbringing, mm-hmm. um, coming of age in New York City during the 1970s and 80s, and and kind of grappling with all that was going on in New York. You know, the death of Eleanor Bumpers, Michael Stewart, uh, Michael Griffith, and we talk about. Um, and you and I have talked separately about even the emergence of individuals like Reverend Al Sharpton in New York City during that time period and 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 how these cases were really so important to helping to 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 fight back against police brutality and all that was happening so talk a little bit about that on your own trajectory growing up in New York and how that informed your work and your approach to this book 
you know, New York showed me the power of stories and storytelling and activism, um, starting with the Black church, starting with my mom at home in Queens. But it also showed me the, the juxtapositions where we were seeing people getting killed by police violence, even when I was in elementary school and junior high school. And by the time I reached high school, um, Michael Griffith was killed in December of, 2000, of, of 1986. And that really struck me. And it really made me see that the stories that we were telling about civil rights movement were incomplete because teachers were telling us a story that we had won um, and we had overcome. And certainly Reverend Al uh, was leading marches and demonstrations, Herbert Daughtry in Brooklyn. There were mm -hmm. so many different folks. I mean, Floyd Flake was out there. There was, there was, a, there was a lot of different black people and, and rallies and demonstrations and, and a ferment that I got to be a part of that was really, really very, very um, inspiring. It was very, very inspiring to be around people who were acknowledging what was going on and, and were trying to change it. And I, you know, I write that, you know, by the time I was 16, you know, when Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing came out, you know, in certain ways that movie affected me more than the Malcolm X movie, because mm -hmm. by the time the Malcolm X movie came out, I was 19, um, uh, you know, close to 20. Um, but the, the do the right thing was the first time I saw black people, um, engaging with the reality that I knew, you know, mm. the reality of racism, segregation, really white hatred of black people, the police murder of radio Rahim, mm -hmm. you know, they really anticipate. Um, but one of the things it shows too, like I'm a generation Xer. We were in the streets too, but we weren't in the streets in, in, in exactly the same way as BLM would go in the streets, right? Mm -hmm. We were in there, we were absolutely in there, but we, we, were, we weren't able to um, build up that kind of momentum that, that, that was later and that was earlier. So it's a kind of interesting generation in that sense. I was one of the people who, you know, uh, protested and criticized Bill Clinton because of the crime bill and welfare reform. But, you know, I mean, I talk about it in there too, that, you know, a lot of black people love Bill Clinton, Jamal, mm -hmm. they love Bill Clinton. So yeah. you couldn't really speak bad about Bill Clinton in the nineties. BLM really criticized Hillary for super predator. And that's one of the reasons why she didn't win. And then they were getting into screaming matches with Bill, but our, our, our generation, our generation, when you tried to say, hey, why is Bill Clinton using Martin Luther King Jr. to talk about black on black crime? We were told to shut up and sit mm. down that mm. we didn't understand what was going on. So it's a very interesting generation to be a part of. And New York City was interesting because you did have the remnants of the black power movement. You had black radicals in there. And Philly was, too. I went to school. I went to Temple University. So we were trying to get Mumia Abu-Jamal off the death row. Mm -hmm. There was there was the move movement that yeah. had been. Uh, murdered by police in 78 and then bombed by the city in 85 a la tulsa a la yeah. tulsa yeah. 1921 they they that they they fired they they dropped an incendiary device they 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 murdered six children and then university of pennsylvania like i say uh in the book um what you know was displaying the bones of those children not yeah. receiving permission for the parents like we are a species right mm -hmm. this species of property right mm -hmm. and yeah. john calhoun called it a, a our peculiar institution right mm -hmm. our peculiar so so that's that's the the ferment that shaped shaped me and i think that it's an extraordinary it was an extraordinary time to be young extraordinary mm -hmm. time to be alive and it's been great to be live long enough to see sort of blm like i said 1.0 is very very important because that laid the seed beds for everything we would see in 2020. Yeah. It was 1.0 where they were stopping people. I was in Boston where they shut down traffic. We, we got a thousand people just out, just through a Facebook post in 2014 mm -hmm. after Eric Garner in, in Boston. And then thousands more came and shut down I-93 in Boston. So, you know, this was huge. This was huge. And it was the buildup to... 2020. Now, 2020 millions came out, but there would be no 2020 and that BLM movement and that so-called political and racial reckoning that impacted the arts, politics, that impacted the NFL and sports, that impacted businesses, that impacted everybody with some soul searching. Not to say it's 
it's it's incomplete. And not to say there wasn't a backlash, but that's because of the organizing that really was largely led by Black women and queer folks and people who had been, um, you know, on the margins, you know. And I try yeah. to talk about the antecedents in terms of the Angela Davises, the Ruthie Gilmores, you know, you know, critical resistance, all of that, you know. Yeah. And the interracial kind of nature of what Black Lives Matter became, right, where you had, you know, over time you had sort of white folks getting involved and young exactly. white Absolutely. It, it became it became a, a multiracial coalition in 2020 because so many and we saw this in the BLM, um, uh, their policy proposals, because their policy proposals helped everybody, including they expanded our definition of immigrants where, yes, Spanish speakers in Mexico and Central America, Latin America. But one, there's Afro Latinos. And then two, what about the black folks from you know West Africa and the Caribbean who are coming yeah. in too, right? Yeah. So we have to treat them with dignity, especially when we see how we treat Haitian refugees um, versus Cuban refugees. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking because this week, of course, marks the anniversary of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, and yeah. what we know is how that bombing then. Uh, spurred a movement in many ways during the civil rights movement where you had young people, children, uh, very much involved uh, in protests. Uh, and it was a very strategic kind of um, tactic that Dr. King and others employed. And so obviously when we when I think about the Black Lives Matter, obviously we're not talking about children that young, but we're talking about young yeah. folks that continue the tr tradition. So this is not nothing, something that's relatively new, right? No, this is this is part of our tradition. I mean, we talk about the the children's crusade. Yeah. We talk about high school students who were protesting in the 1960s and 70s, um, and that continues to, to to this day, and and even in the 19th century. So young people are a huge part of this. Um, and again, there's Generation Xers and and baby boomers who continue the long march. I mean, we are long marchers at this point, and we are. We are veterans and elders just because there are people literally 30 years younger than us who are out in the streets, right? Yeah. yeah. You, you did something in this book that you hadn't really done in other books, and that was that you were kind of central to the story as well. And I was wondering, as a historian, can you talk about that process of kind of including yourself uh, in because it's, it's a mem it's partly memoirish uh, in many yeah. ways and and I and it worked really well I enjoyed as I was reading your analysis also trying to figure out where you were situated in this historical narrative as well but talk to me about the process of deciding to go that route you know I've always wanted to write a memoir and write uh, in in more of a memoir style especially as you grow in the profession in your own writing, there are certain writings you no longer have to do, right? You know, to, to sort of prove your bona fides, you can sort of show people that's there in the library. And so I always wanted to do this. And I thought this was the perfect time because of really the events of 2020. I had been thinking about writing this book as soon as Donald Trump got elected and really started, but um, I was also doing Sword in the Shield and this was on the back burner. But then when, when 2020 happened, I, I really thought about uh, these periods of reconstruction, you know, these periods of reconstruction. And I felt we were living through another period of reconstruction, but I wanted to write something that was also brief enough that people could read it. And mm. I wanted to write about my own journey too, Jamal, you know, my own journey in the way in which I think history for a lot of black folks who are in the spaces we are in, including people who are, um, history griots and activists, not just people in the academy, the Ebony Tower, the Ivory Tower. Black history has always saved us. So we know there are people like uh, Jawanza Kanjufu and, 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 you know, Dr. John Henry Clark and, you know, so many others who, um, uh, uh, Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni, people are part of the Black arts, who are also historians, who are also mm. historians, right? And so I wanted to talk about the way in which history and learning this history and being an activist had affected me because you saw millions of Americans of all backgrounds buy history books in an unprecedented way in 2020, right? Ibram mm -hmm. Kendi sold 2 million copies, How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, you know, Leila Ali and Me and White Supremacy and, and Robin D'Angelo and so many others, right? And they were all on the bestsellers list and for the first time, but, I wanted to talk about 
my own journey in that context as well. Yeah, well, well it, it works really well, I think, because it also gives readers an insight into your background and um, the fact that you're deeply immersed in this work, not only as a scholar, but also as an activist scholar, which I think is really, really important. And it works really nicely. So given that this period of reconstruction, third reconstruction has not ended, right? It's it's ongoing, as you put yeah. out. Um, how will we know, like, how, how will we define its end? And could there potentially be a fourth <laughs> reconstruction? I mean, I, I imagine so, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I hope we don't need a fourth reconstruction, but these earlier periods of reconstruction, have, I think the high points have really ended in violence, right? And that's why sometimes people would say, oh, the January 6th is, is the, the violent end. But I disagree because I think reconstruction is getting Biden, Kamala Harris in. We've seen all these policies that got passed in the last two years, which are really reconstructionist policies. Everything from equity orders to the rescue plan, to the Inflation Reduction Act, to the infrastructure, to forgiving student loans, most of this stuff disproportionately helps black and brown people. Um, even though we did more of all of it because we are uh, the faces at the bottom of the, 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 the well, as Derek Bell reminds us, right? So I do think sometimes people have said, well, what is BLM's legacy? I think the biggest legacy beyond sort of the conversation, beyond local municipalities or cities reallocating some police budgets it, it's it's going to be the, the the massive legislation that got passed during the Biden administration. Without Black Lives Matter, without Stacey Abrams, without Black women, without the Black men too, but they sort of disproportionately for us voted for Trump in yeah. terms of yeah. you know what I mean in, in a yeah. big in a big way. Even though like eighty percent didn't right, um, we wouldn't have um, money for children. We wouldn't have the health care. We wouldn't have um, trying to get equity for black farmers, Jamal. All these different things uh, connected to the pandemic and after were because of that movement and this third reconstruction. So I don't think the end has come. I think we're in the midst of a huge backlash. We've seen the voting rights backlash. We've seen the critical race theory backlash, which is a backlash against black folks telling our stories and influencing the stories of people of color and white people all across the country. So previous reconstructions, I think, during their high points have ended in violence. Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898, white political coup, murder 100 black people, thousands flee, and Wilmington goes from being 43, 45% black to 8% black, mm -hmm. right? Wow. Um, and then the assassination of Dr. King, which is really a big deal because King, would have inevitably been able to lead a much bigger multiracial reconstructionist coalition as the 1970s dawned. So King was always gonna be a person, he was gonna be a threat to Richard Nixon, a threat to everybody, because if they allowed King to lead, li live even until 50, the United States would have changed, yeah. would have changed. And it doesn't mean King is running for president. He wasn't gonna run for president. Mm -hmm. King is a leader, a social movement leader. He's not a politician. He doesn't want to be your president, your king, or your mayor. He's the conscience of the entire nation and the entire world, really. And so right now, that's why I say it's open-ended, because we would not have had these last two years, including debt forgiveness. Yeah, Black folks, we needed 40000 50000 in debt forgiveness, but it still helps. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because part of what people have to understand, sometimes politics is the art of the possible, not every single thing you want, right? Yeah. You know, so so he he did what he felt was right. And people are still going to push back on that um, legally. Yeah, yeah, and of course, if Donald Trump becomes the nominee, which is still a possibility, we'll yeah. see that backlash kind of materialize. I think even greater in many exactly. Ways. Yeah, yeah, okay. interesting. So, what do you want folks to take from? The book, and again, I want to encourage everyone to go out and and get it. Uh, the third reconstruction, America's struggle for racial justice in the twenty first century. But what do you want folks to to take from it? You know, I think the biggest lesson I want folks to take is that stories matter, and what I'm telling here is a story about us, about Black people, and Black people's um, role in shaping and transforming American history over these three generations, and centrally about Black women and Black feminists and Black women's roles as democratic theorists, grassroots activists, 
who have expanded democracy and opportunities for all of us, right? A great example is Black women's role in the 2020 election, Stacey Abrams' role in getting Democrats the Senate so they could pass legislation that then helps not just Black people, but helps everybody. So our stories matter. And I think telling the unfiltered hard history of the United States actually makes us all stronger and not weaker, right? And it is the patriotic thing to do. It's a moral and political good. Um, and the only way we can, you know, James Baldwin talked about achieving our country. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about a beloved community. Fannie Lou Hamer said, until I'm free, you're not gonna be free, right? Mm -hmm. The only way we can all become free is by sharing our story and, and understanding how critical Black people have been and Black women have been to um, democratic renewal and, and, and transformation in the United States. Yeah, yeah, no, well said. Two quick things, and then I'll let you go. The first is I love John Meacham's endorsement of the book. Uh, he <laughs> writes, in this searching, often searing account of our recent past and of our still unfolding present, Joseph writes in the tradition of Du Bois and of Baldwin as he seeks to delineate how tragedy might give way to true justice. Personal and political, human and historical, Joseph's book is urgent, important, and illuminating. And I would certainly uh, agree with uh, Don Meacham, uh, uh, the great Pulitzer Prize winning yeah. historian. Yeah, exactly. And I would finally uh, end this conversation with um, pointing out that Dr. Joseph, you were an emerging scholar of diverse issues that hired many, many, many years ago. Yes, like 15 so, years ago. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So you've been a friend to the publication. <laughs> and it's been wonderful to kind of follow your career and your trajectory when you were at Tufts and uh, yeah. even when you were at uh, Stony Brook uh, and all the work that you've done. You really have done an excellent job chronicling our history. And so I thank you so much for, for your time. No, thank you, Jamal. You've been a great friend um, and, and collaborator. So, and I thank you for your leadership. And I think diverse, yeah, is so wonderful. We need, um, you know, 10 more diverse <laughs> in the higher education landscape. So thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate you. Thanks.